I lived in Canada, man. I love Canada. I mean, I take my kids there. I think it's a great place. I could be 1000x better and my my the wealth I've created, the returns I've generated would be maybe 5% of what I've done, mm. right? Because that country is just opposed to the concept of making money. I mean, if you make money, you might as well be considered the antichrist basically in that country. I'm telling you, I mean, you guys laugh, wow. but that's me. <laughs> you've got high taxes, high cost of living, and somehow if you make money, you're considered the devil basically, right? So your number one hack is being in the US. I mean, I don't think Americans realize how powerful of a hack this is. There is no other bigger hack. Tim is one of the most authentic and genuine people I've ever met. I sincerely believe he's coming from a position of giving and that means a lot. You're going to make huge progress. Welcome everybody to today's Capital Raising Show. I'm your host, Tim Mai. And today I have an awesome guest for you today, Mr. Omar Khan. Uh, Omar is the founder and principal of Boardwalk Wealth, a Dallas-based private equity firm connecting international investors with U.S.-based multifamily real estate opportunities. A boardwalk transacted over $400 $50 million of multifamily transactions. And Omar himself has advised uh, around $4 billion of capital financing and merger and acquisition transactions in commercial real estate and commodities. He is the advisor to uh, many high net worth families and international entrepreneurs around U.S.-based real estate portfolio allocations. Omar has extensive experience in valuing commodities and real estate in three different countries. I'd love to, for you to uh, share that, um, Omar. And uh, yeah, so Omar, you know, since been in real estate for around six years now, has uh, acquired over $450 million, uh, currently has over $300 million asset under management. His company has raised around $100 million. He personally has raised over $50 million. So let's give Omar a big welcome, y'all. Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you for having me. Awesome. Thank you. All right, Omar, share with us a little bit about your background and how did you get into this real estate war? My family's a business family, if that helps, right? So that, that seed was always there, entrepreneurial. Uh, we've been in business like I'm the fourth generation now. So uh, successive uh, generations, you know, you kind of have an idea of basically, yeah, it's a risky proposition, but I guess if you're in an environment that is like that, it is less risky, you know, that leap that you have to take to run your own thing. But I was very lucky, you know, my parents are very supportive. We grew up in a loving household. We traveled the world. I went to great schools and great colleges. I graduated right in 2008, which is the worst time to be graduating as a finance major. But luckily for me, you know, um, I got a job in good uh, bulge bracket Canadian banks, started my career off in portfolio management, went to m &A, did some equity research, and then I moved to the US, um, I think end of 2015, start of 2016-ish, give or take. <clears throat> and from there on in, you know, I had the right set of experiences, right network. And anyways, you know, there was always that thing, okay, well, I should, try to do something on my own now that I have this great network and I have had great mentors and I worked in great firms. Uh, so that was basically the genesis. And then my family owns a lot of real estate. So mm -hmm. there was familiarity both with developments as well as acquisitions. And, you know, from there on end, it was just putting one foot after the other, right? It's like you get into any line of business and then you meet people, you do transactions, you meet people, you do transactions. And uh, I wish I could tell you there was a grand plan to go from A to B right? Or, or this journey, but there's a lot of detours along the way. And people have been so kind and generous that they open doors when, frankly, they, they didn't really have a need to open a door, right? So that's helped me. I, I'm the poster boy for people being kind and generous, opening doors. But, you know, when a door's open, you still have to walk through the door. Right. right? Yeah, that's, that's really awesome. Idea. I love that. I love that. And you mentioned your family uh, owned real estate. What type of real estate do they own? Shopping centers, uh, some hotels, shopping centers. We own. I'm from Pakistan. We own in Pakistan, Dubai, and Canada. So shopping center. Obviously, everybody had their own houses and various houses. Lots of retail, few motels, couple of industrial places, raw land. So it's like you know, a lot of uh, business families you'll meet here. Uh, they have excess money. They want to park it somewhere. They want to invest in something. So they go invest in whatever you know deal they find, right? As opposed to you know. 
somebody just does multifamily or somebody just does retail. A lot of families that have right. uh, across the world have assets, you know, they eventually want to invest it and then they have a diversified portfolio over a period of time. Right. Okay. And yeah, and the reason why I asked that is because I'm just curious what had you chose multifamily versus, you know, a more diverse set of assets like that? Uh, look, for me, starting out, the biggest thing was if I have to monetize my network, it has to be something that's easily explainable, number one. So uh, the concept of multifamily is very easily explainable. Uh, I could have tried to go into, say, a more lucrative business in manufacturing or VCs or this or that where returns are more, but then your sales process becomes longer. And as mm. I'm in a new country, I transitioned from Canada to the U.S., uh, I had a good network, but now I have to monetize that network. So all the attendant benefits of multifamily, I could easily market and sell, right? Now, in my particular case, I was not a marketing person. I'm an operations person. We've I've done a lot of transactions on the corporate side. So the operational aspects of running multifamily, I believe are not as hard as say some of the other businesses people are running in manufacturing or retail and other lines of work. So building and scaling a team out operationally in this regard uh, is less onerous and less taxing than you know if you went into a conventional business where you kind of have to start from scratch. And lastly, the lending side of the equation, multifamily and specific real estate is much, much, much easier than if you are to go, say, start a business because lending is very well established. It's asset back lending, right? Whereas say, if you might have a great idea, uh, but you're say a new consumer brand, as an example, there is right. no available for till you don't, it's a chicken and egg thing. Till you don't become big, you don't have any lending, but if you don't have any lending, how do you become big, right? So a lot of these were combinations of what's the easiest path, uh, what is easily marketable and where is a good fit for me if I have to scale out a sense of operation. So for me, you know, I know a lot of people are, uh, you know, they have uh, some sort of a connection to real estate. For me, it was just a means to an end because we have to see over the long term, say, business cycle, say 10, 20, 40 years out uh, as a family, as partners, as investors, where can we make money on a stable basis? So frankly, tomorrow, if it's another business, we will go do that business, basically. Right. So which leads me to, you know, with with this mark, you know, it's more challenging for multifamily. Are you looking to diversify in any other asset type, especially within the real estate space right now? Are you doing any of that right now or are you still, you know, all in on multifamily? No, we do multifamily acquisitions and development. So we do developments. I have great partners on my platform there as well. We're developing 1300 units in the Midwest. Right. So we are doing developments. That was always a vertical we, we added. We're doing acquisitions. I also have a couple of restaurants, but we just have the operating company there. So those are a very high cash business, right? Because uh, multifamily or real estate, by definition, is a very capital intensive business. You have to feed the beast all the time, right? It's always renos or this or that for you to get a return. But the cash returns, even in good times, aren't really that crazy no matter what somebody tells you, right? It's just the nature of the beast. So this is why as a compliment to us in our line, for our portfolios as well, and it turned out for a lot of our investors, we were in the restaurant franchise space. We were opening our second and third locations this year. But oh, the wow. whole aspect there is because we have an operating company, we don't own any real estate there. It is just the operating company and the fact that we built that platform to go now develop up to like 20 to 40 restaurants in the next five years. Oh, wow. What kind of restaurant is it? This is Clean Eats. This is one of the franchises. We're just a franchisee. Yeah. And we're going to have another franchise we're going to bring on as a license. We are going to be the licensee. And the whole idea is to expand that platform. But again, that is a cash, high right. cash margin business, right? We're getting 15 to 20% cash margins with no debt on our business, right? Oh, wow. well, family is a combination of cash and capital appreciation being the bulk of the returns. Right? right. So different sides of the equation, but outside of these core uh, businesses, multifamily and uh, restaurants, we're not really looking outside. Right. Okay. So let's talk about your very first capital raise. Um, yeah. Share with us what were your challenges. You know, you mentioned you have a network. You wanted to capitalize on that network. So share with us. You know how that how much was that raise? You know uh, any challenges that you went through with that raise? 
Yeah, so I, I distinctly remember, again, I'm not a marketing person because I'm still learning all of these things. My background is operational technical. So that raised for $4 million, basically. Uh, uh, the three part, two partners I had on that deal, they screwed the pooch. They could not raise it. I mean, they raised like $150,000 between them, mm. right? So the bulk of the raise came through me and my sources. And yeah, it was a testing time. And the funny thing is all the people who I thought had money, did not either have money or did not give me money. And all of the people I thought did not have money somehow ended up giving me a lot of money. Oh, so wow. I, it was weird. And I think this is the story of my life. All the people I think have money, they, they have no money. Or maybe they don't give me the money, right? So it was a little arduous. It was a little taxing. I Luckily for me, in my, in my network, I had people that I could rely on and they came on board and everything. But yeah, it was a little taxing, but it also spoke to the power of picking the right partners, basically. So again, there was nothing wrong with my partners. It was just that we were operating on different fields, right? So they were going in a certain direction and I was going in a certain direction. They're great people. It's just that the scale or the network size we had were very different. So right. there was a mismanagement of alignment, but credit to them that they allowed me to basically fully operate the deal, make sure not only did we acquire it, we had a very successful outcome in two and a half years for our investors. So I want to give credit because I've heard lots of stories of partners who screw up and then they double down on their screw up by being ignorant, mm. insisting, and then the whole deal collapses. That sucked. <laughs> so um, so sh share with us about you know you reaching out to people you think they have money, but they 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 didn't invest with you. People who you didn't think like what lesson you learned from that? I guess it's just a function of talking to everyone, or like yeah. <laughs> Look, the the biggest lesson, to be very honest with you, is to number one, or it's like you know what's that saying? You dig your well before you're thirsty, right? So the the luckily for me, the thing was that I had close to ten plus years of uh, say either going to school and colleges with these people, professionally working with these people, all of whom were pretty much accredited, right? It's just, if you're in investment banking, private equity, you're a physician, you're kind of accredited to begin with, right? So a lot of those people, before I actually needed the money inadvertently, I had worked with them and we had developed a good uh, trusting relationship with each other. They had seen the intensity and quality of work I did. You know, so that trust and relationship was built because if I had to hit them up the first time, then I believe I would have failed spectacularly. So that was one thing. The other deal was, to, you know, to not go in with preconceived notions. Basically, a lot of times I felt the people who outwardly seem like they have the most money are people who are basically have zero savings basically typically they have zero savings or close to zero savings and typically it's always people who are even keeled who are you know kind of under the radar those are always the people that typically for me at least or maybe it's a personality type right they are the ones with the most amount of savings and they are typically the most astute people who are willing to go quickly oh wow okay that's that's good um and then you had mentioned that um you know, in the beginning, most of your investors were international. Yeah. Uh, were they mostly in Canada or? Canada, like, UAE, like, and a couple of guys I knew because I went to school with them and worked with them were in Hong Kong. Okay. Oh, wow. Even Hong Kong too. So how did you, I mean, it, not only was it your first deal, but you're taking in international money. Share with us that process. How did you set it up or what's needed to set up to be able to bring in international so it, money it, it's really not that hard uh, people have this misconception in their head it's really not that hard if somebody wants to give you the money and they're serious about it i mean it's not the easiest thing but it's really not that hard look for the canadian and the hong kong guys they already had their accounts open up in in um, the u.s right and they had canadian accounts so it's very easy to open a corresponding u.s domicile account so that wasn't really that hard right and for the guys out in UAE, they could just literally go to an American bank that they had, like they have Morgan Stanley's and the BFAs there, uh, which is basically the same bank now, right? And they could then request having a corresponding account open in the US. Again, you still have to go through certain things. If you want, if you don't want withholding taxes, you have to apply for an item. But again, none of these are unique challenges that nobody else in the world has done ever, right? Uh, applying for an item is really not that hard. You just It's a one-time cost, right? Uh, you can just have any, pretty much any CPA do it for you, right? Any CPA who knows how to do it, do it for you. So my point is that if you have people who are legitimately wanting to give money or are interested or are enough interested, this is not as hard as people make it sound it to be.
right? Now, what a lot of times I've heard uh, people make it sound to be very hard is because they assume you have to do these crazy things and do an offshore account in the Cayman and this and that. And typically those are people who are financially unsophisticated and have seen a lot of Hollywood movies, right? <laughs> in the real world, it's really not that hard, right? I mean, it's not easy because there's more paperwork involved, right? If you're an international investor, but it's not like an insurmountable task that people make it sound. Right. Well, I want to dig more into that because it is a topic that, you know, not a lot of people know about. And obviously, because you, you've you done that, you're very familiar with that process. So it's easy for you. Uh, but, yeah. you know, for us of us who don't no, but know. Just to be very know. clear, it's it's not easy for me. The other party also has to be interested in investing with me. Right. So if the other party is not interested or not interested enough, then no amount of my knowledge is going to help the process because, I mean, frankly, they're the people who are doing giving me the money. Right, right. So any foreign uh, person can in, uh, apply for an ITIN number, and uh, then they and then if they do business under that ITIN number, there's no tax withholding. Is that correct? No, no, no. Because again, what you're doing is then they have to open a U.S. domiciled bank account, right? Which is a U.S. dollar account in the U.S., right? Then, for instance, from all accounts and purposes, we are basically transferring money to this U.S. dollar account based in the U.S. Now, if they want to take their money back to their country, they want to do something, that's on them. That's not on me. Uh, so from my side, I have, because otherwise, if they don't have it, then I have to have, I think it's 30%. I let my controller deal with it. I have a 30% withholding tax, then I have to withhold that tax. I have to file for it. They have to file in their country. Hopefully, their country has a tax treaty with the US, then they get a credit, right? So that process then is much longer. Basically, and the way I tell my all my investors is, look, I can do it. Again, if you give me enough money, I'll do it. No problem. I'm not going to do it for the minimum amount. But the other flip side to this argument is, why would you trust and rely on any sponsor to follow all the compliance? Because at the end of the day, if the withholding taxes are not withheld, they are not filed on the right time, you as the taxpayer are eventually on the hook for that money. Right? right. I mean, you still have, as a taxpayer, you still have the liability. So why rely on anyone? Right. Why not make the process smoother, easier for you, easier for me, easier for everyone. And then everybody handles their own filings. Right. Because so, again, you'll have to file regardless of what you do. You'll have to file taxes. Right. OK. So assuming that they go with the ITIN route, um, hmm. do we as the sponsor have any additional document for the uh, like, do we treat them still as a foreign investor? And then certain documents that they need to I sign. I think it depends see. on your filing. I think if you have, I'm not sure again, I let my counsel deal with this. I think if you have a reg S filing, there's a certain filing you have to check off and then it's not considered foreign. But if it's not checked off, then it's considered foreign. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So shout out to Dugan Kelly. If you got a counsel, you need a counsel. Dugan is a great counsel. Uh, he can advise you on all of these things. Gotcha. Okay. I've also heard about people uh, creating an LLC here. So a foreign person create an LLC in the US um, yeah. and then invest through their LLC in the US. Have have some of your investors done it that way as well? No, my investors typically invest directly the foreign ones. But yeah, look, if you're a foreign investor, you can open an LLC. What, look, you have to realize pretty short of, I'm sure there's some exception to this in the world, right? Most countries, including the US, by the way, right? They want you to invest in their country. They want you to bring funds into their country. The issue becomes when you want to take funds out. Mm -hmm. So, right? So, if you're bringing funds in, the country would have to be insane. If, I mean, if, if the funds are clean and all of that stuff, right? right? If you are bringing stuff, funds in, they're clean, they come through banking channels. Most countries want to open the door for you. Why wouldn't they? I mean, what kind of country would say, don't give me money, basically? Right. Well, I think it's just when you want to take money out, that's when you run into problems. Now, fortunately, you don't have as many issues in the US, but look, there's lots of countries in Europe, in Asia, uh, South America that have currency controls. So there's yeah. very many people that live in those current countries, and then they have to go to a third or fourth party current country. They kind of have to funnel their money through three, four countries to get to, say, a US based entity. But that's not your problem. That's not my problem, right? We're not in the business right. of advising those people how to move their funds around. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. So, cause I, uh, a, a friend of mine, he, he, he's here from, from the U S but he's currently living from Vietnam and he has a bunch of investors that are interested. So I'm going through the process right now of, you know, figuring out what's going to be the best way for, 
you know, for me to channel that money over because Vietnam do not want the money leaving Vietnam. <laughs> Most Asian countries don't. Most Asian countries don't. Like I know India has, even though India is such a big economy, right? So much business happens there. So many rich, phenomenally rich people live there. They still have currency controls. Very many rich Indians. Uh, we're talking like fabulously wealthy Indians, right? They still have to go through all these head scratching processes to even take out like two hundred, five hundred thousand dollars. We're talking like people are worth like two, three hundred million dollars. So every country is unique. It also depends on each country's internal laws. What tax treaty do they have with the U.S.? I think most big countries have a tax treaty with the U.S. I'm very sure Vietnam has a tax treaty with the U.S. But again, those are uh, country and jurisdiction specific items as opposed to a U.S. based issue, because once you're in the U.S., the U.S. government treats everybody the same way. They, I mean, they don't care if you're from Vietnam, India, Russia, or whatever. I guess maybe Russia these days, but generally, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I know you mentioned uh, before we started uh, this call here that in the beginning, the bulk of your investors were international. Now your network has grown a lot here in the U.S., uh, and so you don't have as many international. Um, share with us. Who is your ideal avatar? If you look at your investor, your investor pool right now, are they mostly physicians? Are they mostly in the banking financial world? Like who is your type of investors? Again, I wish I was so much better at marketing because then I could give you all my secrets. And frankly, I don't even know what secrets I have, right? So sure, the most of the investors we have, it's about a 75, 24 or 80, 20 split basically between males and females and domestically at least they are either in stem uh which is you know stem business owners uh lawyers financial people that sort of stuff so they're across the board they're not like one specific like thing right, right. Uh, while we have investors i think in about 40 45 states now right the bulk of them come from the big four florida new york texas um and what is it uh, california california right uh, but again, we don't really care where they come from, right? As long as they invest with us. Uh, lots of investors from the Midwest. And that, that's as high level as I can give you. But hopefully, you know, uh, next year or two years from now, when we talk, I'll have more specifics to give you. But again, for us, we have to realize my wife's a physician. I'm in, I've been in investment bank and private equity. Uh, for us, a lot of these people that are coming in have a similar profile to us. Income wise, schools wise, uh, maybe where they live, the types of schools their kids go to, the types of schools they've gone to, as opposed to, hey, I'm just a physician or I'm just a finance guy or I'm, you know, lots of people are with similar backgrounds as us. Gotcha. I understand. Um, so, has your, most of your capital raising has been just, you know, uh, relationship building, con you know, one on one connection, referrals, or, uh, have you also done a lot of cold marketing, you know, people that you don't necessarily have an immediate connection with, uh, which of those has been? A, the it's mostly warm. It, it's mostly, in fact, it's mostly warm. The cold one, uh, I, I keep thinking about this. I think we need to do more cold just because I feel like we haven't done it. So like there's this whole world out there sort of deal. But right now, I, I would say the bulk of it's uh, warm. So if you're talking from, from like what types of leads or what type of investors we're getting, most of these are, in, most if not all of these are investors that are warm in the sense that either their referrals, they've heard about me, know about me through various channels, they've invested with me before, they're in my network, some combination of these things. And it's always the conversation. That's why the conversation, again, right now, at least, right? The conversation is um, much easier in the sense because they're already converted by the time they come to you. Right. But obviously, the next step is cold traffic and how to take the cold traffic and go. But again, these are, you know, nice problems to have. Right. OK. So, um, I mean, 50 million dollars is a lot of money to raise. Uh, personally, I, think it's more than that. I was checking. It's, I was checking. Now, I think I, we said my assistant sent you an older one. It's like 25, okay. 80 now. Yeah. 75, yeah. 80. Sorry. So, so, yeah, yeah. 75 to 80 million is a lot of money especially from just warm traffic. So uh, share with us, you know, um, how you're able to build such a, a powerful network of warm traffic uh, to, you know, to invest that 
I mean, that's a pretty significant amount of money. So, is it? Because man, I see a lot of other people, and I feel like, wow, I have so, I have so, I have so much more to go <laughs> before I even, you know, scratch the surface of what's out there. Not even going to that. Look, a lot of this eventually boils down to, uh, in my case, going to the right schools and colleges, and then working at the right companies. That, that's just the way it is, mm-hmm. right, guys? I mean, I hear a lot of times, you know, people these days say, oh, what's the point of going to XYZ college or school? And, you know, they don't have like better education. And you're like, no, you're not paying for the education. You're paying for the access to a certain alumni network. You're paying for brand name. It's a bit like, say, if you buy a a higher end Mercedes, right, Mm -hmm. versus a or a Corolla. I mean, both of these, these are cars. You're going to get to the end location kind of roughly at the same time, right? But one just has a higher perception of branding, right? Like that's why it's selling to for like eight, 10 times the cost sometimes. A lot of this I would credit to my parents and some to myself maybe, right? Going to the right schools and colleges. And then when you work with the right people in say professional firms, right? They are able to mold you, right? Because you learn from their habits. Say, how are the high performance functioning? Uh, What do they do? What's their daily ritual like? Uh, How do they perform under pressure? Having those sets of experiences. I mean, uh, working 80 to 100 hours in my 20s in investment banking, no, I hate, I mean, I hated most of it, but that aspect of being under pressure for sustained periods of time and then working to a schedule, working to a calendar, chipping away at a certain problem for like years on what feels like years on end. You know, those are just things that you just learn. Uh, I mean, you you just have to go through that process, right? Mm-hmm. It's a bit like somebody trying to learn how to say ride a bike or learn how to swim by reading a book. Right. You can learn, you can read all the books you like on how to ride a bike or learning how to swim, but you still have to get on the bike and you have to, you know, kind of go through that process. So for me, it was all of these sets of combinations of professional experiences, academic experiences in very intense institutions that then led to having the access to this network and all the other habits around it. But because again, you have to realize you can have the greatest network in the world, Mm -hmm. but if you have a network of affluent individuals, they're not doing me a favor by giving me money because I am making them money. And if right. I screw, if I if I just screw up on this exchange and think, oh, this guy's got to give me money. Yeah, nobody's mm-hmm. stupid. Nobody's dumb. If you don't show up every day, you don't perform. If this person has three, four, five, six hundred thousand dollars every year to give me, right? Chances are I'm not the only person this person knows, right? So I'm always, and I should be, I'm always being judged on what value I can provide. And if I'm not providing value and value isn't like feel good, nice, like uh, stuff on social media, I got to make money. And if I don't make money, all the excuses in the world are not going to account for anything. Right, right. No, that's really good. All right. So figure out if you know the answer to this, but I didn't come from a top school. I didn't go, you work at a top institution. How can I hack this is there a way you can oh yeah you can it's very simple you live in the u.s this is your biggest hack i lived in canada man i love canada i mean i take my kids there i think it's a great place i could be 1000 x better and my my the wealth i've created the returns i've generated would be maybe five percent of what i've done Mm. right because that country is just opposed to the concept of making money I mean, if you make money, you might as well be considered the antichrist, basically, in that country. I'm telling you, I mean, you guys laugh, wow. but that's me. <laughs> you've got high taxes, high cost of living. And somehow, if you make money, you're considered the devil, basically, right? So your number one hack is being in the US. I mean, I don't think Americans realize how powerful of a hack this is. There is no other bigger hack than this, okay? Number two, you have an environment and a group of, say, people. Look, America basically is a... It's a bunch of hustlers, basically. It's just 300 million hustlers. Everybody's trying to make a buck, okay? <laughs> you don't have this level of vigor and vigor in other countries. I'll give you an example. My brother right now lives in Australia, right? Australia is a great country. I've been there two times now. Phenomenal place to visit. But between the high tax, it's the same thing. High taxes, high cost of living, and all everybody wants to, it seems like it, everybody just wants to relax, basically. <laughs> Right. So if you've got to make money, you can't just relax six days out of seven. Right. I mean, stuff doesn't work like that. Right. So in America, basically, the biggest thing is you can market. People are very open to the idea of being sold. Number one. 
Number two, people are open to the idea of like making a decision. Dude, it freaking, the big reason why I don't advertise more in Canada, apart from any other reason, I love Canada. Dude, Canadians take like years to make a decision. I mean, if you're literally telling somebody, go to the next neighborhood, they will sit there and argue with you for six months without just going to the freaking next neighborhood. Right? That's I mean, it's, it's just bonkers, basically. So you have a population here that's willing to try to take a chance and make a buck. And that's your biggest, basically, hack. And so if you're, say, don't go to a top school, don't work in a big firm, I would suggest learning how to market. Like, I'm learning how to do that. I'm not really that good at it. But I couldn't be anywhere successful if I still learned marketing, but I was in a country that wasn't conducive to providing and creating wealth, basically. Right. I love that. Love, love the answer. Um, and then um, do you, in terms of your business model, uh, are you just doing straight syndications? Do you, do you have a fund? As well? I have a fund. Our fund is on the restaurant side, because again, the reason there, the biggest reason is our typical deal is anywhere from like 25 to $40 million on the real estate development or acquisition, right? But on the restaurant side, each restaurant is anywhere from like four or 500,000 to like 750, 800,000. So there, it doesn't make any sense to repeatedly issue a PPN and have all these costs, right? So we have one fund under which it's an evergreen fund under which we raise money. But when we are doing basically, uh, initially when we started off, we did a fund for multifamily, but very quickly we realized because we are opportunistic, like I'm not a programmatic buyer, right? So I've gone six months without buying something and in three months I bought three deals, right? So because I'm an opportunistic buyer, it just makes it easier for everything for us to have, um, say, issue a new set of documents every time around. But look, maybe in a year's time, uh, maybe I go back to the fund model, right? Because I'm they were developing 1,300 units in the Midwest and that's basically a cut, copy, repeat, a paste sort of process. So I feel like there is no one right answer. We've typically been doing fund um, deal by deal, except QSRs. Uh, but maybe in the future, we go to a fund model even for our real estate. Gotcha. Okay. So been through, you know, you got started in the financial career in 2008. So you you, you get to experience what that down market was like. Oh, yeah, man. Uh, I was on the receiving end of it coming into the workforce. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what are you seeing in this market? Do you see any similarities? Do you see like, yeah, what are you seeing? Man, again, I don't know about other people. Uh, this is nowhere near 2008. I mean, I remember I was in Toronto, right? Toronto is a big financial center. I think it's like the second or third largest financial center in North America, right? Oh, wow. I remember for like a two month stretch, I distinctly remember this. Even on job boards like Monster, I don't know if anyone of you ever gone to Monster. Monster used to be a big deal. I don't know if it's still a big deal or not. I haven't looked for a job in a long time. For a two-month stretch, I only saw one job opening in all of Toronto, and that was for a line cook. Okay? Mm, wow. There was no job opening. I mean, we're not talking like bullshit jobs that they kind of straight up no job postings. Okay? Wow. I, hope to, I hope to God it doesn't change and it goes back like that. This is nowhere near that time, right? People still are looking to transact. Transaction volumes are down, but people are open to the idea of transacting. That was a case where people were literally thinking the Armageddon has happened and we are all going to die. So it's a big difference, basically, yeah. Gotcha. What about the different asset types within real estate? And I know you have a strong focus on multifamily. But if you're looking at, you know, um, uh, commercial office, like the, you know, even single family homes, um, do you see any of those assets that are going to be most affected uh, in this you know, market versus the ones that, you know, probably will thrive or, or at least continue to do the same in this uh, upcoming market? Yeah, look, office is taking a beating. There's many secular reasons for it, you know, COVID accelerated the work from home sort of phenomena. But the other deal, I think a lot of multifamily investors don't realize is we have so, like I told you about lending, right? Why I got into this, a, a big portion, one of the three reasons why I got into this. We have, I know every real estate individual thinks they're this rugged individualist libertarian that they ride off onto the sunset on their own horse, right? But the fact of the matter is the vast majority of lending in multifamily is government subsidized, is heavily government subsidized. 
So what happened, and by the way, we're talking like market rate, class A, there's no like low income or anything associated with it. The government has a backstop. Agencies are always lending, okay, in even bad markets. So the, you don't have that in retail, hospitality, office. So this is why when you mm. go to play other verticals, like say office, they're taking a beating and the beating is some like operational issues, but the beating is also because banks don't even want to lend on that, even if you're doing well. So office is taking a big beating right now across the board, mm. right? Maybe if you're like a trophy office building class A++, you're doing okay. The rest are, I mean, it's going to be really bad, right? Retail, depending on where, where you are, what you're doing has also taken some beating. But look, if you're experiential retail, right? Think about it this way. Your local barber, your nail salon, your local corner store, those places are going to be fine, right? But if you're doing something that say Amazon can deliver in one day, yeah, you're, you're kind of screwed. You're asking for trouble, right? And again, hospitality, I, I know a couple of guys, I feel they're great operators. Hospitality as an asset class, I feel is a great asset class. I'm not in it, um, but I feel it's a great asset class, but I see I people tell me, my friends tell me there's lots of challenges there, even though uh, their, um, a, which is the average revenue they're getting per day is higher than what they were getting pre-COVID. So that, that mm. thing has gotten up, the rates are going up, but their problem a lot of times right now is financing. Like if they have a loan coming due and they want to go to a bank and get it financed, you're just not getting good financial terms. That's why a lot of hospitality people are in trouble right now. Not, But again, hospitality is not because of operations. Hospitality is purely capital markets. Office is due to operations and capital markets and retail is a mixed bag basically. Gotcha. Okay. So what about, you know, the challenges within the multifamily space with, uh, you know, rate cap? I mean, even financing, even on the financing side, um, you know, that has slowed down quite a bit in the multifamily side as well, correct? Um, uh, yes and no. Look, if your business is purely reliant on, say, bridge financing, right? Yeah, yeah that's slowed down. But if you're, if you agencies are still open for business, Gotcha. So it just depends, okay. like if your deals were, say, if you're trying to acquire something that is not stabilized, and stabilized is defined as 90% occupancy for 90 days, right? And some other things vary by lender, but that's the high level definition, right? Then, yeah, you have to find a non-agency lender. So banks are either very wary of lending right now, or the terms that they're going to provide you are basically... They're just your deals are just not in pencil, right? So they'll say they have lending, but they just give you terms where your deals don't even pencil. Gotcha. Okay. And then where are you seeing the opportunities, you know, with all these rate cap expiring and and you know, people get in trouble, especially in Texas and Florida too, but your insurance rate has gone up quite a bit. Uh our taxes, property taxes has gone up quite a bit. Uh I, you know, I I uh, I was just talking to a friend of mine. She's uh, taking over an asset that she was a, a co-GP in now, uh, where she's now become the lead person to manage this. And she's looking for rescue funds, uh, things like that. Uh, so, I I mean, that's just a, you know one case. I'm sure there's probably a lot of that happening right now. Yeah. yeah. So what are you seeing as the opportunity in that? Look, just to be very clear, the fundamentals in multifamily, like if you're looking at your occupancies, your, re your rental revenue... They aren't as dire as some people make it sound it out to be. Now, again, occupancies are a little down in most major metros and rent growth isn't as robust as, say, during COVID. But that COVID was also an anomaly, right? I mean, you, you're not supposed to have 20% a year rent growth, right? So that being said, your fundamentals aren't that bad. Where right now we're seeing a lot of people get into trouble is either they have short-term financing, which means their financing is coming due as an example, and they haven't really executed on their business plan. So they're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place where getting new financing is going to be next to impossible or very expensive. Their business, they haven't just straight up just haven't executed, right? So they're having the issues bridging that gap, which means they'll have to bring in money. They don't have any of that, blah, 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 blah. The other issues is a lot of guys are doing well. They might have a rate cap expiring. So let's assume their loan is for the next five years. Okay, loan, not the end of the world. They bought a rate cap. 
uh, say for two years and they've got three more years left, but they just don't have enough funds. So now what will happen is once the rate cap, the hedging instrument goes away, your rate goes up so much that you get into a lot of trouble, right? But again, that's not an operations issue, right? That's a capital markets issue. Right. And lastly, you just have guys that are over leveraged, right? Guys that are stupid, did stupid things, made a lot of money during the bull years, right? And it's there's an old saying, right? You don't confuse a bull market with brains, basically which basically means that, you know, a lot of guys that levered up did that trade. I mean, it really worked for four or five years, right? You could do everything stupid and you would make money. Well, now you're on the receiving end of that equation, basically. So opportunities wise, I think Q4 heading into Q1 and Q2 of next year, there will be certain opportunities. The ones we're seeing right now that we passed on are basically C assets and C locations, right? And I mean, that's not our, I'm not saying that's a bad business model. That's just not our business model, right? We, we don't deal with that demographic. Uh, so we're really not interested in this, but slowly now we're seeing B assets and A neighborhoods or B assets and B neighborhoods, those slowly come on mm. just because uh, operators are getting in trouble. And you have to realize a lot of big operators you even see on social media, their operations suck. I mean, there is no polite way of saying this. They are great at marketing which you have to be, there's nothing wrong with that. You have to be good at marketing, right? But you still need to be good at operations, which is your day job. And a lot of these guys, they absolutely suck at operations. They have part-time people on operations and that thing is not going to work. And that thing is going to sink them basically in the next six to 12 months. Gotcha. Has any of your, your deal either have a capital call or you have to stop distribution just to kind of, um, nope. you know, no, no, we don't have any capital calls. We've always been a group that has a heavy cash reserve balance on the side. My partners hated me for it during the boom years. Nobody hates me now. Basically, mm. we always preserve cash. We always have a focus on preserving cash internally, right? Once we take care of that, then we figure out everything else. That's that's All awesome. And, and, and the other deal also is look a lot of this. And again, we make mistakes like everybody else, right? But the fact is we're all going to make mistakes, but there are certain makes that mistakes that are avoidable, right? Avoidable mistakes are don't be over leveraged. Don't do deals where you, you know, if things don't work out, you don't have enough financial resources to do deals. So it's very surprising to me. I see guys, uh, I mean, again, it sounds bad to say this, but guys that frankly do not have enough financial means, they are doing, trying to do $40 million deals. And you're like, man, if things, if things work, yeah, you're gonna make a lot of money. But if things go sideways, and you need more money to like float the deal for a little while, you got no cash, man. You're a broke guy. You got no cash. What are you going to do? Right? So you always have to go in with the understanding or that the sky is falling. Things are going to be bad. And you have to plan according to that plan. Right? And then things are going to happen along the way, but hopefully better things happen than your worst case scenario. Right. That's awesome. And then, so uh, with the, you know, I mean, you, you sound very conservative. And so, uh, you know, with your planning and making sure that you guys have plenty of cash reserve, did you have to stop any distribution on any of the Oh, yeah, deals? we pause distributions on a few deals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, yeah. we've always, like, and our investors are very understanding of this. We've always, and we're clearly communicating this. We show our cash reserves. We show our cash flow statements. We show where we're going. We show our projections. And we're very clear. We're like, look, man, it is better to be safe than sorry. We have enough cash reserves to last over one and a half years, right? But nobody ever had a problem with more money on their books, ever. In the history of mankind, nobody ever said, gosh, I'm so rich. What am I going to do with all this money? Right. <laughs> um, what What are some of the states uh, that uh, you have assets in, like the bulk of your assets? Uh, what states are they? Georgia, Florida, and South Dakota. And we're heavily expanding more into the Midwest. I started off in Texas, but three, four years ago, I just stopped looking in Texas for a combination of property taxes, insurance costs even then were rising up significantly. And just that we just felt, I mean, everybody has a different opinion that our dollar would go furthest outside of Texas, even though, by the way, I live in Dallas. I love Texas. That's, yeah, that's it. And just, you're the first Texas I, Texan that I know, or Tex, yeah, that, uh, yeah, don't heavily invest here in Texas. And the foresight to see all these, you know, uh, um, uh, cost increase in Texas a few years ago. That's amazing foresight you had. That's, yeah. Well, uh, it could also be luck. Don't, don't discount <laughs> luck. 
<laughs> no, but again, look, you were seeing all of these things, like, let's put it this way, the last two years, two and a half years, they've been really bad for tax increases and insurance costs. But the years before that, they weren't like a walk in the park also, right? So Texas has really good branding, right, in terms of these activities. But I mean, your dollar goes for, look, your taxes are so high in Texas, pro property taxes, right? I mean, your taxes move a little bit. It just kills all profitability. Forget about insurance. Forget about payroll. Forget about all of these things. So everybody keeps talking about revenue growth. Oh, I got like 7% more rents. Right? Your taxes went up by 15, 20%. So no amount of your 7, 8% going up on revenue is going to compensate for your increase in taxes. Yeah, that's a that very interesting insight. Yes. Uh... Especially living in Dallas. <laughs> like, oh, I, and by I, the way, I'm a big proponent of that Dallas. People have accused me many times of being like the, uh, what is it, the marketing and promoting promotion guys for the state of Texas, because I encourage so many people to move here. Gotcha. That's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting that, you know, you're a big promoter of Texas, but don't invest in Texas. That's, that's, uh, that's quite interesting. In terms of, you know, uh, like, tools that you use in your business? What are some of your favorite tools that you use in, in your business? Uh, look, our tech stack is very simple. It's Slack, Asana, um, Zoom, or Google Meets, whichever one you use. We use Google Meets internally because we're on G Suite, right? But Zoom is the same thing, right? Uh, and then a lot of deep analysis, right? But the one thing that I feel, I feel a lot of people are very enamored by systems and automations and this and that. The one thing, at least on our side of the business, operations-wise, you are never going to come get over is if you have the wrong people or the or a bad team and you've invested in the wrong assets. No amount of automations is going to save you. Okay. So if you don't have, the, I feel a lot of times people focus so much on the systems and the processes and they don't focus on the people, right? Getting the right people, the right types of people with the right set of experience, then training them the right way. And then most importantly, paying people. People somehow always seem to forget all of that and they keep saying, oh, people aren't loyal. The generation doesn't want to work. That's all bullshit. If you pay people a proper wage, I mean, in, and don't pay people a wage you think was a good 10 years ago, right? Because everybody thinks when it comes time to asking for a wage, you're in 2023. When it comes time to paying for a wage, you're in 2003, right? So you have to pay people the right wage because think about it this way. If you're paying people and the guy next door is paying them twenty, forty, fifty thousand dollars more a year. First of all, it's going to create resentment, right? Even if the person doesn't leave, they're probably not going to work, right? And if and they're going to bail the first chance they get, and now you got to start from scratch again. And I'm not saying I have figured out a solution here, but I always like to point this out that if you don't have the right people, you don't have the right training, you don't pay them properly, and then most importantly, you don't buy the right asset, none of your tech stack and automations are going to save you. Gotcha. Uh, that's good. I, I want to hear more about your new development. Is like, is that something you guys recently expanded into or you've been oh, doing that for a while? We've been doing that for about two and a half, three years, basically. Oh, okay. It's been a while. And, yeah. So I wouldn't say it's been too long. I'd like to say it's not been too long, but uh, we, we did that again, primarily we're acquisitions, but we were seeing that the margins were being compressed in acquisitions as more and more people enter. A lot of the people that were entering were not, say, financially sophisticated, right, in terms of right either operations or financial management or capital markets. So a lot of times they were frankly paying prices that, I mean, even if everything worked out in our models, we still wouldn't get to that price, right? So, you know, because again, real estate it's not like, say, a tech business, right, where you can have a thousand X return in a year, right? I mean, you go from mm -hmm. zero to a billion in a year. There's not a lot of real estate billionaires, if you think about it, right? Because you you can make a very good living. You're just not balling out of control, right? I mean, like a lot of tech billionaires. So you have to be very careful what you do because there is a ceiling on how much money you can make, right? So we were already seeing that a lot of, because so many people are entering, right, that the returns were getting compressed, if at all they were there, and everything would have to work for you to basically get those returns. So developments were offering us better returns, uh, pound for pound, basically, right? And luckily for me, I have a very good team around me, right? So it's not just a me thing. My partners, Dustin and Caleb, are exceptional people, very sophisticated, very experienced. So again, it speaks to having the right team around you, right? Because I could have had all these ideas and thoughts, uh, but if I didn't have the right partners with me along the way, then these ideas and thoughts would be meaningless. Right. Love it. Love it. For the people that wants to 
learn from you, you know, connect with you, invest with you, potentially, you know, send you deals. Uh, where where would you like them? Where would you like them to go to connect with you? You can just join my mailing list by visiting my website boardwalkwealth.com. The form is right on the homepage. Again, that's at boardwalkwealth.com. Uh, you can also email me at Omar Omar at boardwalkwealth.com. And I believe uh, uh, Tim can add it in the show notes or whatever it is. Right, right. That's correct. Yep. For people who are starting out in this business and yeah. they, I mean, like you're so impressive and you, you know, uh, the what you have accomplished uh, in such a short time, the last six years, just been amazing. Uh what advice or encouragement would you have for the, you know, for the people that starting out and they want to get to where you are? Look, uh, pick a lane, right? So uh, if you're, say, really good, uh, if you had my background, right? you're an operational, financial background, so maybe you're coming from the capital markets, right? That's a lane. But remember, that's not the only lane because there are many people and many um Many things you need to succeed, right? So like I told you, you know, I'm learning marketing, but this doesn't mean I am literally learning marketing. I've hired people who will then help me become better. So I'm not literally learning everything else from that, but I still need to have that level of expertise with me, right? Because frankly, I wouldn't know what to do. And I don't want to go learn. Uh, you know, I just don't want to go learning where somebody else is a professional at it, right? Because then I can collaborate and partner with them. So similarly, figure out what your lane is. Maybe you're really good at, say, marketing right? You can raise a lot of money. That is a very hard skill set. Maybe you are really good at development, but you have to realize that at the end of the day, there's really, a, if you want to run your own firm, you want to do your own thing, there's really only two things that pay exponentially. Everything else, you can basically get somebody as an employee, right? The two skills basically are raising money and finding and sourcing, finding and developing deals, okay? And everything else is important. I'm not, I'm not discounting the other ideas. But if you want to say make a shit ton of money, right? These are the two verticals where you make a shit ton of money. That's okay? awesome. Because, because a lot of, I see this myself. I've got lots of guys that are investment banking, private equity. And they're like, oh, we can analyze deals. And I'm like, great. Nobody gives a shit because you can go <laughs> hire an analyst and they don't have to pay your four or $500,000 a year salary, right? You can hire an analyst for 80 to 100 grand with benefits, maybe 120 grand. So realize that if you don't bring money, or you don't bring deals, it's going to be hard to make a lot of money. That's, that's, I mean, this is the feature of this feature or bug of this business. Right. Love that. Love that. All right, Omar, thank you so much for doing this interview with me. I so appreciate you. Thank awesome. You so much.